Hello, and welcome to the National Endowment for the Arts Arts Education Webinar, San Diego Youth Symphony in Chula Vista Elementary School District, the Restoration of Arts Education. My name is Ayana Hudson, and I'm the Director of Arts Education here at the National Endowment for the Arts. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You are all muted and will only be able to hear the presenters. You can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint. I encourage you to send in as, um, all of your questions and we'll do our best to address as many as we can during the time that we have for the webinar. Please do not use the raise hand button. This webinar will be posted in the podcast, webcast, and webinar section of the NEA website in a few days, so you can refer to it in the near future. This webinar will examine one of the most significant restorations of arts education in the nation. In June 2015, Chula Vista Elementary School District in San Diego, California, announced its decision to reinstate in-school visual and performing arts education at every school. With a $15 million commitment over three years, the district has designed a framework for sequential arts instruction for each of the 30,000 K-6 students in the district. Today, we'll hear from Deluke Smith, President and CEO, San Diego Youth Symphony and Conservatory, Dr. Francisco Escobedo, Superintendent, Chula Vista Elementary School District, and Glendora Trumper, School Board President, Chula Vista Elementary School District. After a brief presentation that will provide background information and set a context, I'll moderate a discussion among our three guests and again, include as many questions as possible from the audience. I will now turn it over to our presenters. Okay, so this is Glendora Tremper, and I want to share a little bit about Chula Vista. Our city is um, about over 250,000 residents uh, and encompasses 50 square miles, and it's seven miles from downtown San Diego and approximately seven miles from uh, the Tijuana border, and it's one of the busiest border crossings uh, in the state. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration with Baja California to increase our economic growth. And uh, we have a lot of wonderful coastal areas, uh, sweet water, wildlife refuges. We, uh, if you take a look at this slide, it is our newest mapping for the city council election. But the major divide that we, we tend to see is the west, east, and the west. The west side is the historical section. and um, it averages about 80% so 80 low income in our schools that are on the left side, sorry. And the east side is the newer portion of it. And on our schools on the east side, they're about uh, only a 40% low income average. And the west side you see is typically our, our, um, our first generation immigrants. And this is Francisco. Up. What you see here is location of our 45 schools. Chula Vista Elementary School District is the largest elementary school district in the state of California. Uh, right now we have about 29,700 students in Chula Vista and still growing. Uh, only two-thirds of Chula Vista has been developed. We still have a third left. We suspect we'll have 55 schools within the next couple of decades. So it's a vibrant community that is filled with growth. Uh, the next slide that you'll see is a little bit about our demographics. 68% of our students are Hispanic. It's very dynamic. Our mobility rate is about 25%, being so close to the border. Uh, there is definitely a binational of the community. We also have one of the largest Filipino populations in, in the county of about 11% as well. 35% of our students are English learners. Um, and we have a significant poverty rate. About 51% of our students are, uh, live in poverty. Even with these challenging demographics, though, our achievement has been uh, at a very high level. Looking at our former assessment, CST, we were over 800 uh, API, 
And even when in our smarter balance, we did exceedingly well. We we were double digits above state average and significantly above county averages in both English language arts and math. So academically, even though we have challenging demographics, our schools perform you know, the same or even better uh, than our, our richer community. Uh, so this is Delug from the Youth Symphony, and we're the partner with the school district. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of background on who the Youth Symphony is and why and how we ended up in this role of collaboration with Chula Vista Elementary School District. Uh, we were started in 1945, uh, within a month after the end of World War II, and started as a single youth orchestra and remained a single youth orchestra for approximately 50 years. Uh, now the programs that we offer have grown exponentially. We have 600 musicians meeting uh, weekly in 11 orchestras, string, and wind ensembles. We offer programs to beginners all the way through uh, pre-collegiate conservatory level students. We also actually open up our programs to a great number of students with low income, family backgrounds, um, and provide scholarships and tickets for them. We also have built out our program beyond the large ensemble experience. We now have chamber music, music theory, uh, pre-professional music institute, residencies with professional arts organizations like the La Jolla Music Society, San Diego Museum of Art, and La Jolla Playhouse. Um, in 2008 and 9, we did an analysis of our overall student population as it related to San Diego County and as it related to San Diego County demographics. You can see that distribution here. This distribution is by county supervisorial district. And the most affluent supervisorial district is, you can see, represented by almost 50% of the student population in our Balboa Park program. And the two lowest income areas of the county are the East County and the South Bay. And you can see that South Bay, where Chula Vista is located, is the, at the very lowest threshold of in our Balboa Park program. So our board of directors um, made a decision to address this disparity in our own enrollment, but in the process we came to understand that there was disparity in access to music education across San Diego County. So we established a vision for making music education accessible and affordable for all children. And the only means by which we could see that happening was if school districts began to invest fully in music education. So these five activity areas became the expansion of our program work in the community. Programs being the actual delivery of music instruction, measurement being the assessment and the tracking of the students, both in musical progress but also in other academic ways. Uh, partnership is the notion that we couldn't do this by ourselves. And so from the outset, we were leveraging as many partners as we could. Uh, community awareness is then building community of awareness and appreciation for the stories of student achievement through music. And ultimately, community action would be where we saw community investment return for music in the school. So we started at two schools. Um, as you can see, these are on the west side. Uh, and as, as uh, Glendora and Francisco described it, the west side is the lower income side of Chula Vista. So these are two schools where the free and reduced lunch population is approximately 80%, high numbers of English language learners, as well as Spanish-speaking parents. And we chose this very specifically because we wanted to take an El Sistema-inspired approach, an approach that connected music instruction with social and community transformation. So the, the program started small. Within the context of this school district of over 29,000 children, we were starting with 65 third graders in the after school hours with string instruction and working closely with those students and their parents to get them engaged and help start telling the story of what can happen when kids participate in music on their school site. It was impressive. The first year uh, in those two schools, I saw cultural transformation in these campuses. You know, 
it was amazing. Sometimes the principal will have a parent meeting, only two or three would show up. Having a performance connected to a parent meeting, there was only standing room only. So the parent engagement increased. Also with students, their attendance increased. In fact, uh, as a reason, one of the, the interesting uh, effects, our district has, you know, won a, a, an attendance, a statewide attendance award. Uh, classroom environments, school climate, all of that improved. And uh, we did a, also preliminary uh, correlation between those schools that went through this program and we, we compare them to their test scores. And it was a significant increase, especially in math, uh, their math, overall math scores. Uh, and and we, we were sold. After the first year, we knew that we needed to take this to a whole different So the district actually began to invest uh, directly in the after-school music program at that point. So in year two, we expanded from the two sites to a total of six sites, and the number of participating third graders uh, grew to 200. So we now had our first class of fourth graders who continued, plus uh, six new classes of third graders. And at the same time, we started to see students who had been in the year one program begin to audition into the Youth Symphony's Balboa Park program. So we started to actually open pathways for them to experience music outside their own community and alongside other children from around San Diego. And so as a school board president, you know, one of the joys is to be able to see what our students are doing, doing when, we, when we come to school board meetings. And we've had the opportunity to see many of our students perform on our lawn. We've been able to see them, see the faces of their parents, see their focus and their engagement. Because we know full well that when students are engaged and focused, then they're more, you know, they're more ready to learn and are going to move forward, you know, not only in their education, but as individuals as a whole. You know, we have parents that focus. We have this one family that the father is actually working in Long Beach, but they made the decision as a family to stay in Chula Vista for their son's education because of the music. You know, we have students who have shared that the fact that the, they weren't really engaged in the school, but once they were had this opportunity to have music in their life, it just brought them right back. So these are the reasons, one of the many reasons why we, we like to have music in our, in our school. So at this stage, when the district wanted to expand <coughs> even further, and it did not have music teachers, it turned to the Youth Symphony to begin piloting in school music. We began by piloting third grade music for all third graders at the six schools that we were also offering the after school program. They also asked us to join a Promise Neighborhood grant, federally funded Promise Neighborhood grant at a seventh school and pilot kindergarten music at, at the school level for the entire kindergarten class. So we kept um, building upon what we started by adding capacity that the school district needed us to help them develop for themselves. Uh, the, uh, the next slide is um, also about that growing capacity. There it goes. And this was about who else started to circle around this work. And you can see here that not only Chula Vista Elementary School District, but also the uh, district, the middle school district that these students feed into at Sweetwater, the city, the after-school providers, and even researchers from UC San Diego. And uh, in the upper left corner, the Chula Vista Community Collaborative is represented. That's our social service partner. They already have a long and deep history founded really out of Chula Vista Elementary School District. And because they knew that we were investing in the low-income families that they serve, they have worked so closely with us and helped us gain the aptitudes we've needed to work well in this community. At this time, uh, hey, music just started to just uh, blossom. And I remember at that time my assistant superintendent, Dr. Nelson, came up to me, we need, we need to create a plan. This is, this is really uh, taking a, a stronghold in our district. So uh, with, with the support of our amazing board, uh, we, we created a 10-year goal, a 10-year plan of restoring music education for all 
schools in our district. And we also, also were very fortunate to through our BH1 Save the Music Foundation partnership that uh, would donate instruments for many uh, of our needy families as well. So in, at this point, we're now into year four. Uh, the school district was beginning to hire full-time music teachers, and the VH1 Save the Music grant supported those music teachers at two sites. In addition, the Youth Symphony continued to run music pilots at additional schools. We've never repeated a third grade pilot at a school. And we also continued to run the after school program at six schools. So this, this slide shows you how we're now scaling out from that original two site year to reaching both the in school and the after school. The trouble clefts represent any kind of in school activity and the um, eighth notes represent after school activity. This is how large it got that, that year. And the blue is the in school music. So what had started smaller as the after school was now being eclipsed by the in school. And you can see the numbers of schools, the number of students, the number of overall activities and reach that we were achieving had gone far beyond um, the pace that we had imagined at San Diego Youth Symphony. And the district just kept raising the bar. Now, the key was, obviously, is how do we integrate all of this? So a sequential arts instruction and art integration came, you know, took a foothold. Both components were uh, supported by professional development. In fact, our first professional development, we, we had just an, an enormous participation rate. It seemed like our, our teachers were famished in you know, how do we incorporate the arts in the classroom. We'll focus on teacher recruitment, uh, partnerships, and really figuring out a way to create equity and access so uh, we can ensure that we can provide quality music throughout the school. And uh, as as a board member, one of the things that we always know is that things like these don't happen overnight. You have to have the vision, which Chula Vista has had, and then the foresight to you know, plan ahead and say, how can we get this done? And then the commitment. That has been key on the, uh, the level of the board, um, because that was the commitment from the previous board, the commitment from this board. So I think that's really important to understand that this is something that goes on and it moves forward, um, and you have to just you know, decide that's what you're going to do and, and go ahead with it. You have to be forward thinking. One of the things that uh, I just wanted to share about, uh, Dr. Escobedo mentioned about our teachers being involved, is we, I went on a school visit and a teacher who was previously in the classroom, but uh, shared with us that she's always loved uh, the arts, all kinds of different arts, and that now because of our, the way we've set up our program and our VAPA teachers, she is now that VAPA teacher, and just that excitement and that you know love shining through her eyes was just incredible. I want to have my child involved in that classroom because you know that it comes from the heart, and you know that those children are going to be really focused in learning. So the key is um, how to start to scale VAPA in school. So we were the we've been the first district to have. And this is not temp positions, but full VAPA positions in the last 25 years. Um, we uh, had music for all K-6 students, including students in special needs uh, at six schools, uh, VH1 grant uh, to, to four or more schools. So, you know, one of the big, the big challenges, obviously, has been the recruitment and recruiting teachers from as far as the Midwest. We have had to go to, but the qu quality instructors are very key to ensure that this program uh, becomes sustainable over time. And as the school district invested more and more in in-school and now was putting full-time credentialed music teachers onto campuses, the after-school program was able to evolve so that we could make the in-school about breadth and the after-school about depth. So what I mean by that is the after school music program is now open to students from across the entire district. And, and in this case, you can see 
that there are, are two sites. We're now running the after school, oh, I should say last year we were running the after school program at two sites. And these additional eighth notes represent all the many schools where children were coming from in order to participate. And it had opened it up to the east side, which we think was important because this is a, an opportunity for the whole of the district to advance for all children. Um, and also, we were able to um, provide more intensive instruction than would be available during the school day. So that's part of the depth as well, is being able to provide more instruction for faster advancement. Okay, this decision of uh, hiring VAPA teachers came through a quite in an intensive process. In California, we have a system called LCAP. And LCAP is what, it's a local control accountability plan where we bring our teachers, our parents, community members, uh, our, our site leaders as well. And we try to figure out ways to enhance, accelerate uh, student educational outcomes. And one of the big issues that came out in the forefront is our teachers need time to collaborate. We want to include the arts in, uh, back in, in school. And so we really created a win-win situation, a situation where we were able to hire over 70 credentialed teachers in music, theater, dance, visual arts, and media. And these, these, these teachers uh, actually uh, are able uh, to free, free up uh, teachers for, for, for collaboration purposes. So this map shows every school that has a full-time credentialed music teacher this year for music only. So um, since, since June, you yeah, hired in exactly. over 70 teachers. 70 teachers. 30, 30 sites now have credential music teachers for every K through 6 student. 14 schools have are teaching visual arts. 17 schools uh, teach dance. And 14 teach theater. And I believe another four teach the music. And in the after school program, we've also expanded. So instead of offering um, the after school program only on the west side, as we did previously. This year, we've actually opened up a third site far to the east. And that has broadened the amount of participation. We now have students, um, fourth through sixth grade students, from 34 Chula Vista Elementary School sites participating in the after school hours. In addition, we've opened up the program to charter and private school students. And we've now got two classes of students, that very first um, pair of years. Those students have now matriculated into middle school, and we have seven middle schools represented. So in total, across our sites, there are over 300 musicians coming to music twice a week for after school instruction, in addition to the music that they're getting in school. Probably our, our most significant challenge is the shortage of credential VAPA teachers in, in California, uh, obviously in the region of, of uh, San Diego. Uh, for the most part, because um, music, there are no teaching positions, or have, there have not been any teaching positions for, I would say, over a couple of decades in, in California, uh, really a, a huge drought. So trying to capture uh, excellent teacher has been has been a uh, tremendous, tremendous challenge. So I think the strand that we've been hearing, that you hopefully you've been hearing throughout this, is that you know music in, in its role has really brought together the Chula Vista students, their families, and the neighborhoods across the whole city. So not even though it started on the west side, but now incorporates the whole of Chula Vista, east side, west side, northeast, northwest, you know, wherever. And it is absolutely incredible to realize that, you know, as a city with all our partnership, we are going, what we're doing is we're ensuring that our students, all of our children, are receiving the, the um, education that they need. You know, it's not just the three R's anymore, but it's the whole child that Chula Vista Elementary School District has, has committed itself 
to ensuring that they have a full and complete education. So a great way to engage the students and is a great music is a great way to encourage the students, to engage the students, to encourage them to be part of something like a symphony and to enhance their education. So I think Wow. Go go ahead, Glendora. So I would just say so I think that pretty much is a, is an overview. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I was just going to say, wow, what a story. What a story. Um, so many questions and really look forward to the discussion that we are about to have. Um, in fact, Lindora, why don't I start with you? Because uh, one of the slides during the presentation referenced the school board presentations that were made. And um, Delug even talked about, you know, the various performance opportunities across the city. And so one thing I wanted to see if you can just explore a little bit with us and help provide some additional information um, is, you know, what was, in addition to, you know, the school board presentations, what was the process or what additional steps were taken to really get a buy-in for an investment in arts education across all members of the school board? You know, many school board members and district leadership talk about the importance of the arts, and I think what really separates Chula Vista um, Elementary School District um, from other school districts is, you know, you really, quote, put your money where your mouth is. So can you talk a little bit more about how, um, how you were able to get the buy-in for an investment in arts education across all members of the school board? Well, I think the, the vision, I mean, what happens is the school board members, we had some pretty um, uh, consistent board members. So that is always helpful. When you have the consistency in your leadership, then it makes it, in a sense, easier because uh, necessarily new people deciding that to take a vision to a, in a different direction. However, even though there have been changes uh, in, the, in the last few years, the vision of the school district has been not picked by just the board, but by picked by the community. So in that sense, it's no longer a decision of one, people, one person, three people, five people board. It is the decision of the community. So if that's the vision and the, the goal of the district, with, including all of the, um, you know, the people that are involved, the teachers, the parents, the, the community, then it's much easier to continue on the same path because we're all looking at the same goal. We may have uh, discussions on how to implement it, but the goal has stayed steady and steadfast throughout. So when new board members come in, it's not something that uh, new school board members are necessarily looking to, uh, you know, take this off its track because it is it is something that is that is nascent from the actual community. I want to add, want Ayana, to add that Ayana, that whole community approach is what the Youth Symphony took as well. From the very beginning, we had the students, as they were learning their instruments, performing on their school sites for the after-school program, performing at the school board, performing at the city council, performing at community festivals. The whole approach of building out the community sense of the possibility for all kids to have music was fundamental, and I think that underpins then the enthusiasm that the school board started to see and feel throughout the district and the community. Correct. Great. And, and continuing with this line of, of questioning, Francisco, I wonder if you can chime in specifically about um, getting support and buy-in across your district leadership, and as importantly, at your school leadership level. I know one of the challenges that was mentioned was professional development for principals. And given that um, arts education had not had a presence in the school district for, um, for many years, can you talk a little bit about getting um, district and school leadership on board with the district-wide approach to the restoration of arts education? Well, that definitely was a hurdle because with our focus on, on testing uh, and achievement, sometimes people will have the misconception that the time allotted for arts will take away from the overall education. So that, that definitely 
uh, was, how could I say, a significant hurdle to overcome. But once, we see, see, I think it was really key piloting it at a small scale and seeing the results and making those connections in the sense of parent engagement, student, and student attendance. LinkedIn, Thank you. Um, mu music readiness uh, to improve test scores. So that 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 was very key uh, to have that type of strategy. And I think also, if I can jump in here, the issue that we have the VAPA teacher, the visual and performing arts teacher, the we the way we're using them is that we know that uh, classroom teachers need to have more time to plan. They need to have, especially you know, with the new Common Core. They need to have that time in which to prepare themselves to work as a team to make sure that all the students are getting what they're needing. And by providing a visual and performing arts teacher to support them, we're doing a dual purpose. See, we're not just adding something else to their plate. We are incorporating, incorporating it with through, uh, throughout the day and providing the teachers with some very needed time to, um, to work together to plan and, and to prepare. And this, I think, is one of the key reasons why it's been so well received by the staff. And, and also our leadership, because of our art integration and our curriculum, they get to see how these specific skills are connected to standards of student Great, thank you all. Um, during your presentation, you talked about the creation of a, a ten-year plan and creating a vision for arts education. Uh, one question from our um, audience, how important was it to create a district strategic VAPA plan? And can you talk a little bit about the process that you used to develop that plan um, in terms of working with the coach and things of that nature? Well, it was a bold plan. We're pretty much ahead. We thought it was going to take us 10 years, but it took us uh, less to have music throughout our, our, our district. I think what accelerated the plan was that whole LCAP process where we, uh, we, we took hold with our community, our teachers, and board, um, and uh, our whole cabinet as well. Uh, so it, it, it was a bold plan, but it, it was something that was an indication that we were, we were very serious. And at the same time, part of the plan was incorporated in the coordinator position to ensure that it's part of our DVISA. We have a person dedicated to coordinate VAPA throughout the year. That was very key. That was very key because um, that that role cannot be distributed. Have to, we need a dedicated person, especially in districts as large as us, to ensure that we get the best teachers, the best uh, professional development available. And it's and it's a philosophy about being proactive and just looking ahead. I think if you have a a, a district like ours that we're always looking ahead and moving forward, then it just, you're, you're maintaining your focus, you're maintaining your trajection, trajectory, and that's how, that's how we make it happen. You wanted to share? I just want to share that, that the plan process was similar to some of the other things we've talked about in terms of inclusion of the community, using the process to actually further build the support for the community. Um, when the plan was first written, um, the Youth Symphony was providing sort of quasi-VAPA support services for the district because it didn't have any. And, it, and thankfully, it recognized that need and wrote it into the plan. And then a year later, when there was actual funding to apply somewhere and apply that in a way that could make a large district level change, the plan was there and it was ready to be deployed. I think if the plan had not been in place, the investment that we've seen in VAPA over this, this year would not have occurred. And did you work with a, a coach to develop that plan? Um, yes, yeah, so San Diego County Office of Education, um, its Arts and Power Initiative has work, is working with the California, um, oh, now I've blanked on the name, 
the California the Arts California Arts Project. Project. That's it. Thank you, Ayana. California Arts Project, and so they have trained facilitators that are able to work um, with school districts in that process, and they've done several in San Diego County, and I know um, Orange County and, and LA County as well. Great. We're going to um, now um, explore some questions that are coming in around the budget. So one question is, what was the operating budget in year one, and what is it today? And Duluk, if you uh, can take uh, this on, yeah, in terms of community opus project. Okay. So um, well, for that very first, that very first to get started, it was essentially a $100,000 budget. That included purchase of instruments, um, the teacher, and um, the program manager. The Opus Project budget now um, is closer to 400000 um, I, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's grown exponentially. Um, and I think what's, but what's important to us is not so much that our own budget has grown, but that the investment on the part of the school district has grown. So that 100000 or even that 400000 when it stands next to the now $5 million that the district inve is investing, really should be viewed as, an, as a catalyst, as an instigator, not as the whole goal of the Youth Symphony's efforts. Excellent. And similar line of questioning um, in terms of the funding, and I guess both for um, Delug and for um, Francisco as well, or Glendora, uh, can you talk about the funding in terms of national, state, and local? And Deluga, I heard you say very clearly that the budget for the community office project has, you know, leveraged or has been a catalyst for the school district investment in arts education. Can you talk a little bit about some of the resources that um, have been put in place to help support the implementation of the community office project? At least from the district side, we're using the supplemental concentrated grants that are used purposely to focus on the improve on the student achievement improvements on English learners, students that live in poverty, foster youth within our districts. We're using uh, those funds specifically uh, to finance our dedication. Program. And those are state funds. Those are state. So for the, the after-school program, um, first, the school district itself continues to invest. Um, approximately a quarter of the budget is covered by the school district. And then we have external um, partners, National Endowment for the Arts, thank you very much, for multiple years, um, California Arts Council, County of San Diego, and City of Chula Vista. So we've got great um, local to national support. We also have received national foundation support, um, and primarily from those foundations that have a particular interest in music education, but also want to see uh, their investment leverage beyond the direct instruction. So the um, NAM Foundation is one of those. Um, the Heller Foundation, now I've got to stop naming them or someone's going to blame me for forgetting them. Um, but. Um, uh, and, and I should also mention that throughout this process, the League of American Orchestras has actually been fundamental. They helped us establish our vision. Uh, we worked with their institutional vision program for three years, and it was out of that work that we created this notion that we could make music education accessible and affordable for all children. And that's what's shaped the way that we now organize all of our work at the San Diego Youth Symphony. Thanks. And one more question around budget. So there's a question that says, how are the front end costs for instruments and their maintenance reached? VH1 is a terrific partner, but there must be more needed to supply the volume of youth. So at this stage, um, the youth symphony has been supplementing um, the instruments that the district has. The district historically had music, so they've had some instruments in their own supply. The VH1 grant is fantastic, and, and each school that gets awarded one of those grants then has a set to use on site. The Youth Symphony is actually providing all of the instruments for the after-school program, and we have 
gone to many different sources for that. We've had many individuals donate instruments. We've also been able to do some large-scale purchases because of grants that we've received, um, particularly from the county of San Diego. And we also have had um, individuals or other programs that have shut down donate to us. So as they see what's going on here, they know that their instrument is going to be used by an individual student, but it's also going to have this impact over a larger system. And we also partner with Sweetwater to help like, with instrument repair. They have a technician. So we, again, it's that partnership between us, the elementary school, the Sweetwater, just all the different partners working together to make this possible. So that's just another example of how we make sure that the, we have the instruments and also how they're maintained. And um, I want to explore that a little bit further in terms of Sweetwater. So Sweetwater, is that the high school district? Yes. Yes, yes okay. correct. And, and, and so they there's have a, a, uh, an orchestra department. Okay, so there's a question that's come in that says, other than the after-school programs at the middle school, are there collaborative plans being developed with the high school district to address the tsunami of musicians that will arrive on their campuses? Yes there, yes, there is one. So um, the high school, Sweetwater Union High School District, is about to undertake the writing of its own uh, VAPA plan. And they've invited the VAPA coordinator from Chula Vista Elementary School District, as well as San Diego Youth Symphony, to be represented as part of the community input on their plan preparation. And they actually have a long history of providing uh, visual and performing arts across the district. They do have VAPA staff already in place. And they have, um, as was mentioned, they have instrument technicians. So they've got some infrastructure in place upon which to build. And we've done other collaborative projects. In fact, the very, very first concert that our community opus projects performed in was a collaborative project with middle school and high school uh, musicians. And so the final piece was an ensemble piece, 400 kids, with ours playing a very simple open string bass line while there's a high school trumpeter playing the solo, right? We've created this connection right from the outset. And our, I should add that our first wave of Opus kids successfully advocated for orchestra to be added at their middle school because they were coming in with so much enthusiasm. And so, for example, up, upcoming, we're going to be our program, the Chula Vista school, uh, school District students are going to be going to Sweetwater board presentation to sort of show them, do a visual example of what it's like because those are the students who are now going to Sweetwater. So obviously now you've got the interest, you've got the parents wanting to do it. So that's another way of not only collaborating, but also ensuring that these kinds of programs continue through the students' education, through middle school and high school. I think one of the un unintended conse consequences is that Sweetwater is now uh, seeing that the quality of musicians it's at a whole different level, and they love it because they they are looking at redoing their program. How do we how do we ensure that we have the they have the capacity for all all the students who are now interested? So it's been a great partnership. We should also mention that there are three other elementary school districts that feed into Sweetwater, and so we're hoping that what is happening here in Chula Vista will start to have ripple effects on those other elementary districts as well in terms of the restoration of arts education. Excellent. And can you talk a little bit about how you engage parents and family members and um, gain them as partners in advocating for music and overall arts education across the district? You know, I think it's a natural Bit. I, it, there's not much coaxing at all. I mean, I, I haven't really in these last four or five years had any naysayers from the parent group. Uh, whenever the kids are performing, it's it's a full house. It's not just parent, but grandma, grandpa, aunts, and uncles. So it 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 truly uh, it, it hasn't been much of a uh, an issue with our parents. You know, we know as, as a previous PTA, when my son was going through his uh, elementary years, as a previous PTA president and, you know, board member and stuff like that, we always knew that the only way to get parents in was to have something with their children, that their children were doing something, performing. You know, what parent doesn't want to go there and see their, their child up on, on stage? So 
it really it really has not been an issue. The parents love it um, and they uh, support it. We, um, you know, if we said now that we were going to cut any of our, of our programs, uh, I trust me, there would be just an uprising from the parents as to how we could uh, do that. And just to give you a sense of scale of parent engagement, uh, one of the school sites last year was their um, second year having a full-time music teacher, and they decided to organize a holiday concert, and they originally planned to have all of the students perform on the same concert. Well, the multi-purpose room was immediately overflowing. There ended up being a thousand parents coming to this event, and they had to have each grade level perform and then leave the auditorium and have their parents follow them so that the next grade level could come in and their parents could come in. This is in comparison to having maybe a couple of hundred families come to the back to school night. So it's, the arts has really reinvigorated parent connections to the schools as well. And I think that was one of the outcomes that was very visible very quickly when we first started the Opus Project. I remember being told um, that seeing a group of parents in the audience at a school board meeting who were not English language speakers stay through the presentation about music was a profoundly different experience from most board meetings. And I, and I think also when you're talking about the, v, the VAPA teachers, this means that every child gets an opportunity, not just those children who are maybe are in an after-school program or who parent, whose parents have a previous interest in, um, in music or the arts. I think that's important to notice, to realize that each and every child, so even uh, parents who didn't know that their child may have had um, like an ability towards music, you know, will have this opportunity to see their child doing something that they never even thought possible. So, Excellent. Thank you. We have one question around um, the, the school district budget and how Chula Vista was able to uh, find room in the budget to pay for the expansion of music education. And um, Francisco, I, I know you talked about um, LCAP in California. So can you, can you talk a little bit more about that in terms of uh, the what LCAP is, the opportunity that it provided, and um, how you were able to allocate uh, the $15 million from district funds to pay for um, arts education. Right right. right, right. Well, California a few years ago, uh, the governor decided, you know, we want to create local flexibility at the, dis at the district level and how to use what they call categorical funds. At one time, California had a series of categorical funds that were restricted funds. Uh, he completely revamped how districts are being financed. And what he said, I want to make sure there's local flexibility in each district with accountable measures. And so this formula, this new formula, this new revenue formula, uh, calibrated the percentage of English learners, percentage of students that, are, that live in poverty. We call them the free reduced lunch counts, and also the number of foster youth. Um, yeah. Uh, so so uh, every district, depending on the percentage of students that are in those three categories, got a specific amount of money. So as a result of this, what we call supplemental and concentration grant, that pocket of money is is to be used for for the purposes of increasing student achievement. We, as a district, decided to use part of that money for this VAPA focus. So that what this VAPA focus does is allow then our teachers to collaborate, work on student data, work on, on, on enhancing lesson planning, and even having time for many professional development opportunities as well, while students are then undergoing the music or some type of visual and performing arts. So uh, hopefully that gave, gave you a, a real superficial understanding and how the whole finance system in California radically changed. I, I also want to mention that what I think is some, is, needs to be clear is that 
it, people always think, well, we're putting this money you know, on music. It's over and above. It's just extra money that you have. But if it's part of the fabric of what you're doing, then, for example, with our VAPA teachers, we would have to, uh, we're, we're using them as a tool to, uh, to allow our teachers to have uh, time to have professional development or to work in groups. So we would be putting money towards professional development maybe after school or in the weekends or during the summer. But yet what we're doing is we're incorporating the VAPA teacher, visual performing arts, so there's other, besides music, there are all the other arts, so that all this can happen at the same time. And yet the students are also benefiting because we can do professional development in the summer. But why not do it throughout the year so it's, it's a concentrated effort, everybody's working together, and we're going to get more benefit and more engagement from the kids, for the kids. And I want to add one point that, um, or amplify one of the points um, Dr. Escobedo made, which is the accountability. I think one of the things that's interesting about the new funding allocations from the state is that it doesn't exclusively look at test scores, or the accountability plans are not exclusively about test scores. There are things like school climate, parent engagement. Mm -hmm. There are some of these soft factors that, that the arts actually can also contribute to fulfilling on the part of the district. And the common and core standards common. also fit into this. So about the fact that you want the children to look at things different way, learn in different manners. So um, the arts are always very helpful in that. So they're actually incorporated into our new standards. So it's not an addition. It's just part of it all. Great. And, and follow up to the question about LCAP and the allocation of funding. Uh, a question from the audience, what happens when the next recession hits? How are you preparing for the future? Well, remember, LCAP funds are not additional funds. They, they, they are part of what we used to receive as categorical funds. We are still suffering from the effects of the recession. You know, there's a misnomer that we're getting more money now. We have not reached the levels of, I believe, 2007, 2008. So we're, we're not receiving any more monies than back then. What we're doing, like Glendora said, we're, we're reprioritizing how we use the money we used to receive, but with the ability to be more flexible with that money has helped us significantly. So I, I just want to make sure sure that the audience knows that, yeah, you know, we don't have, you know, more money than we used to have, you know, back in 070. No, it's a re redistribution. It's how it's distributed. It's the same pot, but rather than putting a lot of um, saying that, okay, this money can only go for this or for X, Y, Z, it just said that as a school district and the governing board, we're responsible to our district, to our community. So it's our responsibility to use our money that benefits our students in the best manner. Uh, and so we, each district is different. We have different needs, different priorities maybe, but both different needs and different situations. So how we use our money is now left more, not always, but not all of it, but more, more up to us as a board to then look at our community, how can we best support our children, and then how do we want to distribute. It's, it's a choice that we consciously make of how you use your money. And I want to add that that was the fundamental conceit that the San Diego Youth Symphony had when we started. We believed the money existed, but the priority didn't. And what has happened in Chula Vista is that they have prioritized the arts to such a scale that we're all taking notice. Ooh, excellent. Um, so we've talked a lot about the community opus project and the, the model for music education. We have a question from the audience. Uh, describe how the music model is being expanded to planning and implementation for visual arts, theater, and dance. So you're asking how, how it's uh, like, uh, like 
So we have a, we have a, sort of like the music. What about the other visual performing arts? Okay. Right. So we know that the the fifteen million dollars that has been allocated over the three years, we know that that's to support um, arts instruction in all the art forms. And so a lot of what the webinar has been exploring is um, the great work of the Community Opus Project and partnership with the school district and the community, and how that has really leveraged. Um, an increase in music education, in school music education across the district. And given that the district has a commitment to all the art forms, so the question is how is the, the music model in terms of the partnership with Community Opus and that leveraging in school music education, are there lessons learned from that model that's being applied to the planning and implementation for the other art forms? So. So you know, it is. We have the VAP, we have a VAP. Of course, we've been talking about the music because this part, we're exploring this partnership right here. But we do in our VAPA plan, it includes all of the arts. So as with music, we're always looking to have partnerships. We are the the VAPA teachers that we are hiring have uh, experiences in the different uh, arts uh, venues. So um, you know, I think that that is something that we are doing. We're doing. We have like. Um, an arts integration with La Jolla Playhouse for the uh, drama. So we, we do have all these different um, plans, connections. They're, they're, not as, um, they're, they're not as fleshed out as with because of our community, uh, because of our, commun our um, partnership with, uh, with the music portion of it, but we, we do have that in our plans. What was gaining also some steam is our work with CODA, and this is an organization where our general ed teachers are able to start integrating arts as they teach Common Core. So we've had pockets within our district. This is more within the general ed spectrum in, in, in how to incorporate certain projects, and so lesson plans are being created and integrated. And what's really interesting in those specific sites, the articulation between the VAPA teacher and general ed is becoming more and more integrated, grained uh, in certain schools. So right now we're, we're at it. So final question. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. So final question, um, if everyone can just very briefly address what's next? What are your, what are your priorities for the future? Well, I, I would definitely, one, one of the plans is to see this evolve. This is the first time we're doing this district-wide. And we're going to take a step back and just kind of reflect you know, what are the lessons learned? Uh, we want to make sure that we have um, excellence throughout the district. In instruction, we're going to survey our, our teachers, our community. So we, we, we want to look at the effects of this year and how can we incrementally improve our process as well. So that, that's really our next step is to examine implementation and how do we become better next year? Yeah, and how can we include, as was you know alluded to earlier, all the other all the other arts, not just the music. So we want to do that. And then as a board, we just are always having to take a look at all of the data, not just testing data, but seeing how, what our community um, is needing. How can we always improve the education of our students? And just revisiting, as Dr. Escobedo said, and how can we improve, expand our horizons, and uh, include many more uh, community partners. And for San Diego Youth Symphony, we've learned so much from this partnership that we are now seeing has applicability at other uh, school in, in other school environments. So it's become very clear to us that restoring arts education is has to be a collaborative process, that school districts actually want and need the support of community organizations like ours, and that there are a number of community organizations that would like to have this kind of influence, but they maybe don't quite know where to start or how to do it. So for us, we're looking at two tracks of ongoing activity, 
in addition to running these programs here in partnership with Chula Vista, but one track is related to taking what we've learned and applying that directly with other school districts, and the second track is taking what we've learned and helping others learn how to apply it with other school districts around the country. I just want to add also one of our future plans is working with UCSD. I think we're almost close to the midpoint where they're actually uh, mapping out the dendritic growth on students' brains and how they're developing, and is there a difference as, re as a result of arts education. So it's an extensive longitudinal um, experiment that's being conducted. It's going to be very, very interesting to see already some of our early findings is are definitely seeing some interesting developments. I believe it's called the corpus callosum, where the left and right hemisphere are functioning at a higher level and how they're interconnected. So uh, that definitely is going to be quite interesting. Well, my goodness, thank you all uh, tremendously. And for those of you on the webinars participants, here are some ways that you can keep in touch with us, with the arts education team here at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'd like to tremendously thank our webinar guest, President and CEO of the San Diego Youth Symphony and um, Conservatory, Deluc Smith, Superintendent Chula Vista Elementary School District, Dr. Francisco Escombido, and School Board President, Chula Vista Elementary School District, Glendora. Tempura, uh, temper. Thank you all so, so much. And I'd also like to thank the amazing arts education team here at the NEA for the amazing work that they do every day. Please remember that this webinar will be archived permanently on the NEA website if you'd like to reference it in the future or if you'd like to share it with your colleagues and partners. Again, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today.